hands off, actually, because this is very informal. We wanted to keep this one really informal. It's an in conversation this evening um, for everybody just to get some insight on Shettle's recent series. Um, my name is Leila Fach. I'm the artistic director at Burris, and I'm so pleased that you could uh, join us this evening. Um, I think on behalf of the whole team, I can say that we're really proud of this exhibition. So thank you so much, Shettle, for trusting us with your work. Um, Shettle has been working on this series for about a year now. Um, and what you're seeing is really a combination of a lot of uh, phone calls, a lot of um, different iterations of it. And yeah, I think it's safe to say that this is probably one of our strongest physical exhibitions that we've had. So thank you so much. Um, for those who are not familiar with Chetto's work, his work is completely code-based, so he creates his work with algorithms. He's based in Norway. He's flown in last night from Norway uh, to join us uh, for the reception evening. And he sort of made a big mark for himself in 2021 with some pivotal series like Archetype um, that has kind of spread his name across the digital space. We um, are also joined this evening by Melanie Lenz, who is the Curator of Digital Art at the Victoria Albert Museum. So really wonderful, Melanie, always to have your input um, for our exhibitions. Because one of the things that we're really interested in at Verse is that kind of we work so closely with artists who work in the digital space, and it's almost like a parallel universe with the, with the rest of the art world. And, I think, Melanie, you relate to that as well because you specialize in digital art and a lot of artists historically have been always been on the periphery of the wider contemporary art world or the art, modern art world. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, Melanie has over two decades of experience in curating, writing, researching. Uh, she's also one of the judges at the um, Lumen Art Prize. And um, she's one of the co-curators of Chance and Control, Art in the Age of Computers, that took place in 2018 and 19. Um, she's published many papers on early computer art in Latin America, gender and technology, and especially collecting and conserving digital art, something that we all, actually a few of these conversations came up amongst um, our visitors this evening. So without going any, any longer, um, thank you for being here and yeah, over to you. Oh. Thank you very much, Leila. It's really great to be here uh, with uh, everybody and also specifically with you, Shettle. Um, so we've just had a fabulous introduction, but I just wondered if in your own words you could describe um, yourself and your practice. Like, how do you see yourself? Right. Yeah. So my name is Seattle Goli. Uh, I am a generative artist from Norway. Um, I, um, I guess what is, what is uh, re a returning thing in my, my art is, is the exploration of um, the interplay between chaos and order and also intentionality and uh, and uh, chance um, so I, I tend to have a very a, a, a clear visual uh, but usually with with some some pretty complex structures behind uh, and I uh, I take great pride in in trying to to convey these structures in a very clear and minimalist way. Amazing. Thanks. Before I ask my next question, can I just check? Everyone can hear? Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Oh. No, if people can hear, I'll just plow on. I just didn't want to start and then sure. realize that not everyone could. Yeah. Okay. So brilliant. So for so really me, one of the things that makes your work and your practice so distinctive is the variety and the range of like your use of existing and homegrown algorithms and how you experiment with structures, color palettes. Um, and variations, um, and equally how you provide others with the tools to do so. And this sense of community engagement and open source is something I'm going to come to at the very end. Um, but I thought maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about how you got into making art. Right, yeah, well, um, weird story really, but uh, I, um, I started doing uh, graphic design, I started studying graphic design in, in Singapore, uh, where, where some of the... Um, some of the teachers were, were teaching uh, processing um, the uh, the visual making uh, making uh, programming language, and uh, I didn't really make much of it at the time because I didn't know how to code. But uh, later on, I, I started to 
I started to code. I, I started uh, software engineering after that. So I, I computer science, and I um, I picked up again the processing tool uh, as a as a tool for for learning new algorithms and learning new new uh, ways of, of doing things in uh, in coding. Um, so this this kind of evolved into me. Um, taking existing algorithms and tweaking them and, and uh, introducing some randomness in order to make some, some intricate structures and intricate visuals. And uh, as it evolved further, I really left behind the, the, the algorithm, the original algorithm, and just focused on, on making, making systems uh, that would provide for, for interesting visuals. Uh, so that was kind of how I started, and so I've really done generative art as long as I have done coding at all, um, and I've done coding as long as I've done generative art. So, yeah. No, it's fascinating. It's really interesting to hear how people end up where they are, and also, you know, looking, I guess, looking forward and looking backwards. So, yeah, um, would you say it's fair to say that experimentation is at the heart of your process? Um, um, I've read before that the asking of the what-if questions is kind of central to your work. Like, how do you think about experimentation? Yeah, um, it, it, it varies uh, the process, but, but uh, some of what I feel is, is my most interesting pieces have been, have started where I have thought of a, a process in my mind and didn't really know how this would look if you actually implemented it. And that, that is the, really the strong suit of the computer, right, that you that you, you would have no idea to replicate this, or you would have no chance to replicate this by hand, or feasibly by hand. But uh, when, you, when you compute this, you, and you, you push the button, you will get the output of whatever you coded in. And, and uh, uh, usually the, the result is nothing you want to see, but sometimes you, you, you get these, these structures and, and these, these visuals that you've never really seen before, and uh, I think that is a very interesting approach to, to gen art. Um, you, don't, you don't need to do it like that. Usually, I, you could also have a very clear visual in your mind about how, what you want to achieve, and then, and then kind of follow the, follow the road in order to, to achieve that. But, uh, but having this more exploratory uh, phase is, is uh, at least a very good challenge for yourself, I feel like. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which actually leads me well, quite nicely to my next question because I was thinking about uh, processes and this is a subject that's uh, very much of interest to me because the V&A is a museum of process and techniques as well as like final outcome. I know obviously sometimes there's an, maybe an overemphasis on process but I guess I'm interested in asking you how important it is that people who are looking at your work that they understand your code um, and programming versus appreciating the aesthetic value of the work. Does this come into play? Is it a factor or is it not for you? No, uh, hopefully everyone can get something out of this. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think any, at least any programming knowledge is not, not required. Um, that would almost be detrimental probably, seeing flaws in, in how things are done maybe. Uh, no, I think uh, um, I, I wouldn't have, I really want these pieces to, to stand on their own and I, I don't want them to be to be interesting as a product of being generated by a computer. Um, um, so so that, is, that is quite important to me. But, but yeah, uh, uh, I would also guess that, that people that have, have some knowledge about the building of structures like these would, would find it interesting the way I have done things. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, and I hope everyone here agrees, that that very much comes across through this show. Like, it is the work I feel that we're appreciating. And it's great to have, like, that additional layer of, like, the hard work that's gone into creating it. But as standalone pieces, they also... Well, also, I guess, they're shown in multiples, but it really does uh, come through. So, yeah, right. I think that's definitely been achieved here. Um, so, I guess I want to move on to ideas of emergence, chance and control, which you've mentioned, and randomness, all of which are make or can make generative art both like rich um, and fascinating um, and you've also mentioned that unexpected results aren't actually always interesting ones but how do you um, like how do you think about balance in your work like how, how do you 
use both chance and control and randomness and right. can you elaborate maybe a little bit more about yeah, that aspect? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so yeah, generative so art is always about introducing, I guess, randomness into your, your pieces, but it's really about, in a more abstract sense, about, about giving away some control of what you're doing. So you are leaving some decisions up to the computer. Uh, Maybe some some aspects that you aren't that that aren't that integral to the to the quality of the piece as a whole. So um, um, so I guess there's always this balance about what do you want to be static and always there in a way, and what do you want to be to be left up to the computer to decide. And I always find it hard to find this balance because the if you are reaching into pure chaos, I guess. Well, on the on the way far side, you have pure noise, which is just pure chaos, and you won't really get anything from that. And but but I guess the the um, the more realistic chaotic piece in this sense would be would be just just uh, a uh, a landscape where where you don't really see a lot of patterns, you don't see a lot of repetition, you don't see a lot of intentionality. And although those pieces will all be very unique, technically, they will look very similar when you look at them as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, on the way other side, though, uh, where you, you keep the order, you will see striking patterns, uh, but you will pretty quickly see repetition uh, within the pieces because there's not that many ways of creating, creating variety in that, in that uh, edge of the spectrum. Well, in the middle, where you have this, um, either you have several patterns or you have flawed patterns that are kind of have some some randomness introduced. I feel like that is really the like the the, um, the bright point where you will you will start to get a lot of associations from the real world because the real world is filled with imperfect mm. patterns. <laughs> So, so you see, um, yeah. So, so for these pieces in particular, whenever you make these these block patterns that are sort of flawed in their repetition, sometimes you can you can draw a lot of different uh, associations. Like here, it's a, a clear association to buildings mm. and, and uh, architecture, but it's also very easy to see see uh, a traffic jam or or a. Uh, or a uh, a room, uh, or a some sort of uh, office space, or something like that. You know, because we we tend to we tend to repeat our things. We tend to make systems out of things, and it, they are never perfect. Um, so 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 that is kind of where I feel like the most the most associations are being made. If you see a pattern, we I think we can categorize that as a pattern, and then we move on. And if we see chaos. We see chaos and we move on, but in the middle there, we are we are drawing a lot of associations, almost uh, uh, subconsciously, I think. Brilliant, thank you. That was really insightful to hear your perspective on that. Um, okay, so my next question is: um, You state on generated space, which um, is like an online platform, and I kind of see it as being, in some ways, akin to like a sketchbook. Um, that some of your work is more serious than others. And I just wondered here, in this sense, are you referring to the complexity of data structures employed in your works, or the duration of time that it takes, um, or the playfulness in some of the titles, like particularly like Hedgehog? What for you, when you talk about seriousness of the work, what, what are you re referring to? We had like just for everyone else, like a little informal chit chat about joy and playfulness, and yeah, how do you balance, or how do you think about that in your practice? Right. So in one way, I guess none of it is serious in any way. Um, I guess some, some of them tends to be more useful as they are very one-to-one -one visualizations of, of useful structures and algorithms. But um, yeah, so I guess it is how much they verge from usable, <laughs> usable things uh, and um, how much it has been um, tampered with in a very that is stupid in every other way than making something that is visually pleasing. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, I, I actually I actually call 
call the pieces on my website sketches just because okay. it is meant as being these these uh, uh, low threshold things that you don't want to promise people a finished product there. You, you just want to see something that has been started on and gave some sort of value without it being a finished product, in a sense. So that Yeah, I find I that really, really that. interesting. And although mm. sometimes digital art is, um, as Leila mentioned, it didn't seem as distinct from other forms in that sense, it's very similar to other um, ways in which artists work. There is that process behind where you trial, there's trial and experimentation and error. Um, right. And yeah, you need that space to try out these different things. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, I guess talking of trying uh, different things, you've talked at the beginning about the influence of Casey Reese and processing, um, but I wondered if the earlier generation of computer artists has also informed or inspired your work. Um, here I'm particularly thinking of Paul Brown, who's a British artist who in the 1970s made quite a lot of work around cell cellular automata, mm -hmm. um, which is something I know in your work inspired by Conway's Game of Life, you've referenced in your 2020 work rules um, some artists are very informed and aware and others less so. So I just wondered, um, yeah, if you're, when you've come across, at what point in your career have you become aware of like the older generation? Does it still inspire and inform or do you look for inspirations in other places? I, um, I definitely find inspiration from the, from the earlier, uh, from the earlier generative artists or computer artists, uh, especially in the way they, they um, uh, turn rules and sets of rules into, into visual uh, or, or kind of translate it into, into visual, uh, visual pieces. Uh, so that is, that is something I am looking for uh, all the time because I feel like the, the purest thing you can do in this space almost is taking these very strict rules, very simple rules, and, and letting them do all your work in a way, and then just having a thin layer of, of, a, of some sort of visualiza visualization on top, which, which, creates, uh, which can create wonders for the, for the uh, what's it called, for the, how, how, how intriguing the, the piece would, would look. So, so especially that, the, that kind of the translation from rules Mm -hmm. uh, or the, the result of rules uh, into, into the visual space. That's been uh, something I've been looking for, yeah. Okay. But outside of generative art, is there other, other inspirations that also um, get you excited? Or? Yeah, well, I, I, I tend to take inspiration from, from every field, um, every sort of process or, or system. I, I, uh, I tend to try to... to visualize uh, if, if it uh, if I find it feasible I guess uh, because there's um, yeah it's it's this it's often the system that is in the focus for me I, I try to start with the system and and make and I guess that start, so, sounds very very abstract because what is the system but but making some sort of of uh, digital structure or system that that can later be, be visualized, and it doesn't really matter that much how you visualize it. But I, I, I have this very, I have almost this philosophy that I try to visualize structural complexity through visual clarity. Uh, so uh, I try to make it kind of as structural uh, as as complex uh, as I can, and but but not so much that I, I don't manage to, to make a very clear representation of how it was, was made. Um, yeah. Okay, so I guess pulling us back to this idea of emergence, right. but kind of yeah. one way I think about it. Um, I've got two more questions and then I'm gonna throw it open to the floor. Um, I realize you're all standing and um, uh, yeah, so I thought I'd end by asking, yeah, first of all, um, I referenced at the beginning this, um, coming back to the idea of open source, um, how important is it to you to make and share tools for others to explore the creative potential of generative visuals? Yeah, um, I, it, it's pretty important to me. I, I felt like learning how to do things myself. I, I found open source code from other generative artists very important and very useful. Uh, and uh, this is just 
the easiest way to give back, really, and uh, and encouraging other people to to try this out. Uh, so people learn in different ways, of course, but but I learned a lot from just downloading other people's code that they made public, seeing how they tried to do things or how they did things, and uh, and and trying to replicate that, trying to build upon that, and uh, so that is that is uh, what I've been doing. Um, and doing really well. Like I just think it's a really fascinating part of your yeah, post, your and, practice. And uh, I guess the the other side of it is that you get to see uh, what comes out of things when when people are actually building upon your code and, mm -hmm. and using it in ways you didn't think of yourself. And uh, that is just very. Um, I think that is how you you how we can really progress the field is by mm -hmm. by by uh, making the the code we make available for other people, although there's this clear uh, drawback, of course, that people might use this and, and take it as their own and, and, and trying to do something with it. But I, I think it's a, for me, it has been a, uh, a good trade-off, I, I guess. Has that, is that been something that you've encountered today? Only, only in very minor cases okay. that didn't really make any problems for me. But the, I've, I've been lucky in that way, I guess, uh, because I know people have, have struggled with this. and. And uh, I have no problem understanding people that don't open source their code. But for me, it has worked uh, uh, this far. Maybe people don't manage to read my code. That's the <laughs> issue. So that's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. And my last question, just to bring us back to the room and the works on display here. I was only familiar with your um, works online and print. So it was fantastic and a surprise to see the sculptural pieces in the exhibition, especially thinking about um, slightly biased. Tropical modernism is just opened at the v &A, so there's that really nice connection thinking yeah. about urbanism and modernism and structures of the monument. Um, but to return to the sculpture, how, tell us how that came about. Is this the first time you've done it? It is the first time I've done it. I, um, it was something I, I, I came up with as an idea pretty late in the process and uh, I, uh, I ran it by, uh, by Anna and, uh, and the Verse team and they, they thought it was a great idea. So we, yeah, we just uh, all honored to Verse for, for making that happen. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a surprisingly small step from my, my current code and to, to make it into something that could be made 3D prints out of. So, uh, so that was just a, yeah, I guess a, a, a happy accident that this was actually possible. Because I, now that I see them, I, I, I want to make hundreds of them. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, with that, um, should we open it up to the floor if people have got questions? I don't know if there's a roaming mic or maybe people just shout. Is there time for questions? I think it's nice if there is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. What are you coding? Um, JavaScript. Uh, no, I, I usually use P5, uh, which is a JavaScript port of processing, which was the tool I, I started with. Um, but uh, a lot of my pieces also don't really use that uh, because there's, I guess, compared to compared to a lot of generative artists, the the display part of all of this, which is the stuff that requires these kind of libraries. It's a pretty thin layer. There's not a lot of complex things happening there. So, so the the use of these these graphic libraries are not really that important uh, or critical for me. No. Yeah. Uh, there is a certain, um, uh, a, there is this parameter of, uh, of how, how filled the piece is with color. Uh, we didn't really reach the, the full potential on that, uh, but, uh, uh, but that is one of, the, one of the parameters on the pieces, is, is how full they are with, with, with color, and it's also um, if you don't see, it's the, these are the, the asymmetric pieces, and here's the symmetric pieces, which is also a parameter. Uh, but I intentionally um, kept the number of, of parameters in these quite low. There is only one color palette, for instance, because I wanted the, 
the the whole feel of the whole whole series to be pretty uniform in its uh, in its uh, in its visuals. Yeah. I'm really glad, actually, talking of a question about palette colors was something that I actually wanted to ask about, because obviously right. that's a kind of a crucial and an essential part of your, the way in which you work. And um, yes, yeah, so that's been something that you've built up over a long period of time, building that library of... Yeah, I, um, I always find color to be very hard. Uh, it's, um, I always need help. So I, 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 uh, I try to find, find places that, uh, or, or looking at, old posters, movie posters, movies, uh, and everywhere I find really to, to find good, good compositions of color. And uh, then I, I kind of take that base of colors and I, I tweak them to kind of work for that exact piece. But um, I think increasingly I, I, I've grown my confidence in, uh, in working with colors. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug for a book I just wrote about colour at the V&A, so right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should send you a copy. <laughs> right, yeah, do that, do that. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, it's, because it's almost like either it works or it don't, and if it doesn't work, then I, I feel like the whole, the whole piece can be, can be ruined. So, so colour is very important and, and very hard, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Is there any other last question? Yes, uh, if you illustrate the future that we Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is that is kind of a question with a lot of answers, I guess. But so officially, um, <laughs> in the NFT space, these have three parameters, I think: uh, sym symmetry, color, fill, and. Um, and uh, no, it's maybe only those two. Um, oh, it's the it's the uh, yeah the the way they repeat in a way. Um, uh, but under the hood, there's a lot more, right? But but then, um, but those are not very translatable to, or it's not it's not very usable for people really. So so they are. But but you're always working with parameters, and and some are. I tend to, to keep them as, as these specters so that you won't really, uh, it's, not, it's not that, it's not that uh, good to, to have, have hidden pra parameters that are very uh, easily recognizable either because then it should have been a parameter. But, but uh, I tend to, to, to make these scales. So, so now there's not, not a parameter that says no color or color. There is this specter of, of how much the piece is filled with color, uh, which I, I think makes for a more more uniform look again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, one last question at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. There. I, I don't have any. Uh, um, anything against that? Um, that would definitely be something I could uh, could do. Um, uh, and I, I guess this would be be perfect for it, really, uh, because the the three D is already there. This is kind of what. So these were built like a refinement almost uh, of the base or algorithm of the archetypes, because these are actually allowing me to make these three D models, which would be more or less impossible for the for the old al algorithm. So. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, something I would uh, look into. Yeah. Well, if there's no more questions, maybe on that note of like what's possible tomorrow and like what it keeps you ex excited and um, new right. adventures, we'll wrap it up. But so it just leaves me to say thank you so much. It was really, really great to talk and hear about your your work. Thank so you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.